I mentioned obviously earlier that women, it's not mandatory or obligatory upon them to cook for their mother-in-laws or for their father-in-laws. However, if it's a order of the husband or if it's a big order of women, just say if it's a desire of the husband rather than an order, if it's a desire of the husband, a chahat of the husband we say in Urdu, then obviously if the wife now obviously wants to do it or does it, then it is now, when you look at it, mandatory when it comes looking at it from an obedience of the husband's side. Does that make sense? Because remember, obedience of the husband is obligatory for a wife as long as he's not telling you to do something sinful or something which is impermissible and unlawful. So now just an example, if the husband, I said, desires that his wife should cook for him and also for the household, and if that's something is which the husband wants, then it comes under the obedience of the husband as well. So obviously looking at it from that aspect as well, that obviously it does become, obviously not mandatory per se, but obviously looking at it from the obedience of the husband's point of view, then it will become something necessary. Okay, now the next section very briefly we're going to touch on, on page 22, is with regards to uh, intimacy, physical intimacy between the husband and the wife. As you can see, we haven't uh, touched on it in any detail here. But uh, there are some books like, there is a book written by Mufti, Mufti Ibn Adam which is entitled Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations. So in that particular book, the Imam or the Mufti in detail has talked about sexual relations in terms of what should the intentions be when it comes to intimacy between the husband and the wife, also with regards to how often should this intimacy be and also that intimacy is actually a right of both the husband and the wife yeah many of us think that it's just like a husband's demand intimacy but actually if you look at the middle point or the middle paragraph of page 22 it's actually a right for the wife as well okay it's also a right for the wife to basically ask the husband for intercourse and if he says no, and that leads her to then commit intercourse or zina with somebody else, then the husband will also be partly to blame as well. So what I'm trying to say is that intimacy, it's also the right of the husband, and also equally, it's the right of the wife as well. Now I want to elaborate or go on to mention another point which you obviously could write on the notes or on the blank page on the page next to you, page 22 is a question which one of the brothers asked early on and I didn't say that it's coming up later or I'll mention it later and that is with regards to birth control and abortion uh, now I'll just touch on abortion just very quickly now in Islam in Islam if a woman falls pregnant and 120 days have passed. So in other words, four months have passed. Now, it, and now the, the woman or the couple, they want an abortion. Now if 120 days have passed, then it's not permissible for the couples or for the mother to abort the child. So after 120 days, it's not allowed. Why? Because mention the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, on the 120th day, the soul is put into that fetus. So therefore, any kind of termination of the fetus or the baby will be considered as murder. Will be considered as murder and homicide. So therefore, after 120 days, not allowed at all. The only situation, obviously, is that if there is a life and death matter, the mother's life is in danger if she was to have a child, then in that case, fair enough, she could have an abortion. But again, that has to be done with the consent or with the mashwara of local scholars and imam, rather than she herself deciding, oh yeah, I'm going to have an abortion because my life is in danger. 
Obviously, doctors tell her, imams have also said, okay, it's best that you do, then only then she can have an abortion after 120 days. Before 120 days, can she have an abortion? Now, scholars again have said the same, that no, it's still impermissible. But again, if there is a valid reason, like, again, uh, something wrong with her life, or something's going to happen to the child, or the child is going to be born with some kind of really, really like uh, life-threatening diseases or something, well, the alam or these kind of things, then in that situation, before 120 days then, abortion would be allowed. But again, I'll say that it's best that each sister or each situation is kind of taken to the local imam, to the local scholar, to the local mufti, and obviously, you know, you get mashura from it. Because obviously, one of the answers I've given just like a general kind of thing, but as you know, certain sisters may have different complications with their pregnancy, may have different situations, may have different issues. So therefore, it's best that you speak to the local imam, to the local scholar, to the local mufti, and inshallah, he'll uh, advise you accordingly. Next point, very quickly, is about birth control or contraception. I think one of the brothers at the back was asking that particular question. So is that allowed or not? Now, there are a few hadiths with regards to contraception which can be found in particular in Sahih al-Bukhari. Some hadiths, Rasulullah has described contraception as wa'dul khafi, which means that it's a form of murder. Yeah? It's a form of killing. And in some other hadiths, Rasulullah sallallahu described contraception as something where there is no pointing. What does that mean? It means here that he could use birth control, but if Allah wills for the woman to fall pregnant, then she will. Even though the man may be wearing a condom, but if there is a will of Allah for this, woman to fall pregnant, then she will. And that's why when you look at all the contraception methods which are around, they all say that it's not 100% what do you call it, uh, guarantee that you're not going to fall pregnant. You know, they'll say it's 90% or 95%, but they'll use that 5% then to show that it's not a guarantee. So what I'm trying to say, and this at also backs that up as well, that you could do contraception, but if Allah wills for the woman to fall pregnant, Fall pregnant. And then there's another type of hadith about contraception where it seems as though that Prophet allowed it. There's the hadith that Rasulullah said, or Sahabas in particular were saying, that we would do contraception whilst the Quran was being revealed. What does that mean, Quran being revealed? In other words, Quran was being revealed regularly to Prophet, but never a verse or an ayat was reveal to you, prohibit the action. Yeah? So three types of hadith when it comes to contraception. Some hadith say it's allowed. Some say there's no point in it. And number three says it's not allowed because it's a form of murder. Now the scholars have kind of reconciled between all the hadiths and what they've said in a nutshell is that to do contraception without any reason is makru. Makru meaning slightly disliked him, Makru Tanzi. So without any reason, yeah, you know, just without any reason, you just want to have uh, use contraception, it would be Makru Tanzi. However, if there is a reason, then it will be permissible to use contraception. And some examples of reasons which scholars have given, such as husband and wife's relationship is unstable. So, unstable means they're always arguing, but they're having intercourse here and there. So now the husband feels that, look, if we were to have a child, then it's gonna, our marriage is going to end up in divorce, and then the child will be left without a father, so on and so forth. So what they do is that they use contraception. Or like, say, for example, the mother just recently had a child, and she doesn't want to have another child anytime soon, because she wants to give adequate care to the child, she wants to 
you know, raise that child properly. If there's another child straight away, then she may not be able to look after the two properly. So these kind of reasons, then, it is permissible to practice contraception. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that it is allowed, but as I said, uh, in particular for uh, when it comes to contraception, you need permission from both sides, i.e. from husbands and also, more importantly, wives as well. Yep. Because remember, as I said before, uh, having children is a right of the wife as well. Yep. So now, just say the husband, for some reason, that he doesn't want to have children, the wife may want to have children. So now, it doesn't mean that the husband just like practices contraception without the wife's permission. Similarly, the wife is not allowed to do, you know, you know, a use of pills, say for example, without the husband's permission. So it has to be ijaza and permission for both for contraception to be allowed. Okay, it's not just husband permission, but that's it. And it's not just only the wife's consent. You know, permission from both sides is required. Okay, moving on to the next section, wedding night. So again, I've, it's straightforward. It's not that much uh, explanation needed or required here. We can obviously look at that later on. But as I already explained before that, uh, again, this is like more advice to you new couples or a man thinking of getting married or a wife thinking of getting married or they may have got married recently and obviously the question which arises when it comes to the wedding night or when it comes to the beginning parts of their marriage is when should they get intimate like is there a, a time limit that they have to get intimate with each other. Like, is there a time limit? Like, within, like, a week, within two weeks, whatever, is there a time limit? Now, in a nutshell, Islamically, there isn't a time limit when you have intercourse with your wife. In the first time we're talking about. It all depends on when the two are kind of comfortable with each other. Okay? And again, that all depends on you know the moment when, when you are comfortable and also your wife is comfortable with you. Because again, many people think that there has to be intercourse on the first night. Yeah? So again, that's not, that's not a teaching of Islam. Yeah? It's like many people just assume this, that there has to be intercourse on the first night. It's not necessary, it's not compulsory that you need to have intercourse on the first night. Nor is it compulsory, some people think that it has to be done within three days or a week. There's nothing like that. It all depends on when you and your wife are comfortable with each other. With each other. And as I said, you know the moment when it is, and obviously at that time, you kind of uh, perform it. But it's, there's no such rule that it has to be done within three days or a week. Because again, you get some stories from husbands that they think oh, they have to do it on the first night. And again, going back to the man, he think that if they don't do it on the first night, they're not a man. So it has to, you know, again, these kind of things. So again, there's nothing like that in Islam. Whether it's like, you know, you could do it you know, whenever you're ready, but it doesn't have to be done the first one. The reason I'm saying it is that sometimes when a wife, say, for example, she's tired and she's a bit, you know, uh, shy the first night, she's alone with a man, strange man, again, she may not feel comfortable to have intercourse on the first night. So again, you know, if she says, you know, that husband then start having doubt or oh, doesn't she like me, you know, isn't she in love with me or is she seeing somebody else? They, they have these kind of doubts. So again, you know, brothers, you don't need to have those kind of doubts. You need to put yourself in her position. You know, she's got married. This is the first night she's spending with a strange man. Yeah, it's going to be awkward for her. All right, so you need to be gentle. You can't demand it like on the first night you want to have intercourse or second night or the third night. Obviously, give it time and obviously you know when the moment is right and then at that time you will have the intercourse. But as I said, there's no Islamic ruling that it has to be done on the first night or on the second night or within a week or within three days. When the moment is right, then obviously you will have the intercourse. And the last couple of points I mentioned on page 23, 24 is basically I mentioned who's in charge. Basically, like who's got the, who's the, got the responsibility and the role when it comes to the husband and wife relationship so 
as you know, it's the husband. It's the husband's responsibility is mentioned in the Quran. Al Rijalu Kawwamuna Alayhisa, which means that men are the caretakers of women. I've also mentioned that it doesn't mean that the husband doesn't or like should take this role and be a dictator. Like whatever he says, the wife has to follow or listen or abide by. Uh, the husband should take mashwara, should take advice from his wife when it comes to certain things about tarbiyah or raising the children or upbringing the children. He should get advice from his uh, wife as well because it's mentioned in the hadith of Sunan al Bayhaqi that Rasulullah has said that whatever is agreed through mashwara, mashwara means that consultation with other brothers, it is like wahi. Wahi meaning that it's, it is though that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, so it's very important, and this is with a lot of things in life when they come to running organizations, very important, take mashwara from other brothers. Don't like think that it's your baby that you want to dearly the way you want. You know, take mashwara from other brothers and from other sisters, and the same also applies with manipulate issues as well. And lastly, I've just mentioned uh, a point here about some rituals. Like, why have I mentioned this? I've just mentioned this basically as I was explaining uh, about rituals and so on. So I just mentioned there that sometimes uh, husband and wife they don't really have uh, spend that much time together. So uh, you know, husband's busy with work, wife's busy with sometimes she may be working as well. Now what happens is that. If this, this, this is quite important as well, that there has to be commitments from both sides for the marriage to work. There has to be 100% commitment from the husband's side, 100% from the wife's side. If, say, for example, one of them's dropping in the commitment, because the husband's only putting in, or well, he's putting in 100%, but wife is only putting in 50. Or husband's putting in 50, wife is putting in 100. So where there is lack of commitment in the marriage, then that's where the marriage nose dies and that's where the problem starts. Yep. So what I've written there, rituals, is basically some uh, rituals, uh, certain things which uh, husband and wife you know, should do or try to maintain over the week so they have, they're doing something together because unfortunately like the, the life we live now is always busy, husband's always busy at work, wife's always busy and so on. So I just mentioned certain things that they could do together, that they pencil in their diary, that okay, this is what we're gonna do, no ifs or buts. You know, just say for example, there's a, a study circle once a week. So just say the local mosque is providing a lecture, they say once a week on tafsir. So husband and wife, they just like make a plan, you know what, we're gonna go to that lecture, no ifs or buts. So if it's like six o'clock on a Saturday evening, that's it, six o'clock on a Saturday evening, it's just reserved for that lecture, where we're gonna go together, we listen to the talk there afterwards, we go out for a meal, something that we'll do together. So the benefit of that is that you have that pre plan they know that, okay, this is the time when we are gonna to spend together, no other functions, no other appointments, no other things or nothing else can interrupt that. That's just for us together studying our deal. So certain things like that, like, you know, uh, setting a day when both the husband and wife will clean up the house, you know, making a phone contact during the day, you know, little things like that just to keep that relationship fresh. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, I know husbands as well that they hardly see their wives. They work literally the entire day. They leave early in the morning and when they come home late at night, they're basically, the wives are either tired or she's kind of gone to sleep. So uh, don't make the marriage like that. Yeah, you know, request your brothers and sisters upstairs as well. You know, if you feel that in your marriage it's hit a, I won't say a rock, but it's hit a, hit a lull in the marriage where you're just like two robots in a marriage, you're doing your own stuff, she's doing her own stuff, you're hardly interacting, you become two kind of strangers, then before it reaches some kind of problems and issues later, you know, try to do these kind of rituals where you kind of set it up and look, once a week we're going to be doing this, once a week we're going to be doing that, you know, whether it's shopping, whatever, so that you two together can, uh, you know, maintain the marriage and keep that level of commitment up in the marriage. So, so that concludes the, uh, the course. Obviously, there are certain things which we 
have been touched on, but inshallah, uh, if there are certain parts of the course book which some brothers are unsure about, then uh, you could have a read of it, you could ask me later on, or if you want, you could email the mosque even or something, and then you could. Okay, now one minute, I want to take some uh, questions now, but first I would like to uh, take the question from the sister side because they've been asking quite a few questions and I've just uh, left them on the desk. So, uh, firstly, we take questions from the sisters which they asked early on. Uh, one sister asked three questions here. The first question is What if the husband demands for the wife to give her money even though they are financially fine? He purely demands because he says it's not fair that she is not doing anything. He disregards all her duties in the home and so on. So basically, in a nutshell, the husband is not allowed to demand yeah, her money. Obviously, you may think how she, what kind of money she's referring to. It's like all those child benefits and so on. And obviously, because she's not working. So all those kind of child benefits. Remember, child benefits are for children. And any other kind of benefits you get, Obviously, that's for the wife to keep, okay? So the husband can't demand anything from, a, uh, from his wife, as I already explained. Uh, whatever the wife earns, it's her exclusive right to it. So whether she actually works and she earns it, or whether it's through benefits, whatever, it's hers. And again, she doesn't have a... Well, it's hers, and obviously the husband doesn't have a right to it. But as I already explained, that if the husband, say, for example, is in need of the money or you want to chip in for the, uh, for the shopping or for the bills and so on, then you can do so. But again, technically or Islamically, it's the wife's and uh, 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 he doesn't have a right. Okay? Even though the sister mentioned that he wants her to help her, like help her probably financially. So again, it's up to the wife to decide. If she wants to out of her own will, then fair enough, she'll get reward and thawab. But if she doesn't, then she's allowed to keep it and she will not be considered as disobeying her husband or anything like that. Question number two, can the man say, it's my house, my car, because I work and I finance everything. Can he say this if she is keeping her own money and he is finance everything, financing everything? Is keeping her own money. I think uh, you probably asked me that uh, he's probably got some money or something or... She's earning her own salary. Or oh, she's earning her own money. He's providing for everything and then for him to say, well, I've, uh, I've given you the last, so that's technically mine now. Okay. Uh, obviously, like, yeah, if, if the husband's paid for it, if the husband's, like, paid for the, the car and the house and... He's actually paid everything and the wife hasn't then, yet technically it is uh, the husband. <laughs> but uh, obviously, you know, with, yeah, so yeah, he can't say it. If he's paid for it, see, so the wife doesn't have a right in there. So it is his car. Obviously, what the wife has a right in is that in the house, one room, as I mentioned before, is hers. So she's got a right to that. But besides that, obviously, the, the husband owns that, so that's okay. Unless if the wife wants to obviously chip in and so on, that would be different. Okay, rule number three, what if a husband comes from work and refuses to help the wife, okay? So it's like a classic example where comes a, a husband's working all day, then he comes home and then he doesn't want to help out with the household chores. He says that he's too tired or he can't look after the kids and so on. So, um, as I said, like, again, the rules are mentioned. The, you know, the main thing is what the husband and wife mutually agree and what the wife sees. Now, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, if the husband's been working eight, nine hours a day and he comes home and he's really knackered and tired and he can't help with the household chores, he can't look after the kids then, the wife should kind of understand that situation and think, you know what, my husband's tired, I'll do the household chores. And obviously the question the sister asks is that, of the husband says, well, I can't do it today, but I'll do it on my day off. So, you know, if the husband's kind of like willing to uh, negotiate or he's willing to, you know, look at, okay, I'll help out another day, 
then obviously, you know, the wife should listen to that excuse because obviously the husband's working naturally, he's going to be tired, he's going to be, you know, well knackered and so on. So then, you know, if you tell him, well, you need to do the hoovering now, you need to do this, and you need to do that. Obviously, the husband, you know, he's tired. So obviously, the husband, the wife should look at that and obviously, you know, let him do it same on some other day as he is kind of requesting to do. Similarly, the other way around as well, that sometimes if the wife is ill, husband should also take the lead in the household chores as well. You know, when the wife is really demanding ill, the husband should not demand the wife to like clean, cook, these kind of things. Probably in that situation, you know, husband should think about either cooking himself or, you know, ordering some food from outside. So, you know, two-way thing here, like uh, if, he's t uh, if the husband's tired, uh, wife shouldn't demand also at the same time if the uh, the wife is uh, also very tired and she can't do it then husband shouldn't demand as well. Uh, another question here is uh, if a husband and a wife have their own house and due to some bad family circumstances the husband's brother now lives with them. It has been nearly three years. What is the saying on this? Should he be asked to move out considering feelings of husband and in-laws? What should the wife do to so again, uh, obviously, brother-in-law, husband's brother, so basically brother-in-law is living in the same house as the husband and the wife. And it's basically been three years. Now, obviously, the, the question the sister should ask herself here is, uh, by the brother-in-law living in the house, is it causing her some, like, how should I say, like, is there anything where the laws of the Sharia are being broken. In other words, with the brother around, she can't, you know, she's finding it difficult to maintain the hijab and further because the house is tiny and small. Or are there like situations where the husband's out at work and then the wife is then alone at home with the husband's brother? Now, even though we're saying that nothing's happening between them, but you know, if these kind of are there these kind of assumptions or these kind of things going on where you know they are alone together or the wife can't maintain the fund and the hijab. Now, as you can see here, that failure, if it was for a week or so, there was some, some problem, the brother had to live there, then we can understand. But it's been three years. So now the question the sister needs to ask is that look, with this brother being there, uh, is he causing her some inconvenience in terms of her uh, acting upon the Sharia, in terms of her, uh, you know, the Parda rules, the hijab rules, in terms of her uh, being alone with him when she shouldn't be in reality. So if that is, then obviously she should, you know, speak to her husband, you know, tell the husband, look, Islamically, this is not something acceptable or appropriate that, you know, you're at work and then I'm alone with your brother, you know, as the hadith says, alhamdu al mawt something bad could happen. So in that way, she should try to speak to her husband and basically think about, obviously, it's, it's, it's been three years as well, like, and think about him uh, looking for another accommodation. What if a woman has purchased and furnished a house and the husband has not contributed? Can a woman demand for her husband to purchase his own house? Islamic rights. Uh, Okay, so uh, basically, I think uh, what this question is basically that uh, a wife has bought her own house, in other words, and the husband is uh, living in that house. Uh, sometimes it would happen in particular when the wife is from this country and her husband's from Pakistan, Bangladesh, obviously she brings him over and obviously uh, she buys the house, you know, she does a lot for the husband. Can a woman demand for a husband to purchase his own house? Uh, I don't understand the wisdom behind that because obviously if he's going to move out or something then how are you going to like live it together? Uh, so unless you know she's asking that can he demand her to like basically pay for the house or something or whatever the house which they are living in then uh, she can but she can't demand it if, she, if he wants to buy it then fair enough but uh, she can't demand the husband to buy another house or or the same house. So that would be the answer to that particular question. 
Is Nikah valid if a sister has been married for over three years, but her Nikah was never consummated? And how can she attain divorce if her family are against it? Okay, now basically what, uh, what this question is telling us that uh, probably a sister got married and for three years she hasn't had any probably contact with her husband or marriage hasn't been consummated at all. <coughs> so is this nikah valid or not? So the answer is yes, the nikah is still valid. Uh, keep, very mind, keep this in mind here that as soon as the marriage happens, unless the husband gives his wife the lock, or she kind of cancels the marriage or rescinds the marriage through a Sharia council. That man and woman are technically husband and wife Islamically. So even though the husband hasn't seen his wife for 10 years, hasn't had intercourse with her, as soon as they did the nikah, that's it, they're now legally husband and wife. So the question the sister asked that for three years the marriage hasn't been consummated, yes, the nikah is still valid. How can she attain divorce if her husband, or sorry, if their family against it? Obviously, the, she's tried to explain to the family that, look, you know, it's been three years, the husband, look, hasn't consummated the marriage, he's not interested in me. Uh, she obviously explained to the family, and how can she attain divorce? Obviously, now there's a lot of like Sharia councils around, so through the Sharia council, obviously, try to speak to her husband, tell him to do the honorable thing and give her talaq and divorce, but. If he's not willing to do that, then the Sharia councils, where obviously they have a set procedure in cancelling and rescinding marriages. Okay, some of the questions. If further problems occur in marriage, where should one refer to as guidance? So, uh, obviously, what the Quran says that if there's problems, then she should, uh, if there's that problem, try to sort it out amongst each other. If that is not possible, then as Allah says, hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliya, which means that an arbitrator, hakam from the boy's family and an arbitrator from the girl's family. So in other words, these two people, arbitrators, they will sit down from the boy's side, girl's side, they'll sit down and they'll kind of discuss the issue. They'll say, okay, Husband's got this problem, wife's got this problem, they try to discuss it and come to a, a conclusion or come to an agreement. Obviously, if that is not possible, then something like if you get the local imams involved, the scholars, the imams involved, they could try to sort out issues. Even, even though it may be, you know, slightly expensive, shall I say, or even like maybe away from the Sharia, but if it's within the boundaries of the Sharia, I'll even try marriage counselling. And if that is not possible, then obviously, you know, you may then think about separation and so on. But that should be like the last, the last uh, situation. Yeah. Another question: Husband has a tendency to get angry when confronted with issues. Strategies do are to resolve it effectively. So basically, uh, if a husband gets angry. Then what should the wife do? I think that's what the sister is asking. So obviously what should she do is, uh, you know, the things which makes him angry, then don't bring that, don't raise that issue. So, I don't know, just say if the husband gets angry on petty things about, uh, I don't know, like, the, I don't know, when he walks in, the, the shoes are all over the place. So, you know, that drives him mad, so he gets angry on that. So if that is making him angry, then what should the wife try to like sort that out, make sure that the shoes are, you know, in order, whatever, when he comes in, when he walks into the front door. Or if, say, for example, there's some pet hate of the husband which he doesn't like at home, and uh, he gets angry very quickly, so what should the wife do is that try her best to uh, basically uh, uh, you know, resolve that so that the husband doesn't get angry with those issues. Uh, some duas, the sister is asking, uh, duas, obviously, uh, uh, obviously, what she could do after every namaz, she could just make dua. She make dua like uh, after every namaz that oh Allah, my husband's got anger problems, so on and so forth, and just as for uh, dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through that way. Uh, 
Okay, another question the sister asked is that what should a woman do if a man lacks emotional intimacy? Uh, I think what the question sister is referring to is that you know you have IQ and you have EQ. Although it, you know you have mental intelligence, how you know to measure someone's intelligence, but EQ, you know, uh, psychologists say that it's more important for a human being to be an expert on this. Like the Prophet Sallam, right? The reason why he could uh, relate to different people was because he understood where they were coming from. He didn't judge everybody through the same lens. He looked at a person, understood their you know ability, and then spoke to them on their level. You know, he treated the young differently, he treated the elderly differently. So I think in a marriage, it's very important for a husband uh, to kind of have some sort of emotional intelligence. Um, if a wife, you know, is upset about something, you know, to listen to her. She may be wrong, he may be tired, but you know, just give her that ear, you know, so that she feels comfortable and secure that you know, her husband is paying attention to her needs. He may not, and sometimes women don't want the answers. You know, sometimes us men, we have a habit of just providing solutions. But all a woman wants is just for a man to listen to her, and that for her is her solution. But we as men, you know, because we are kind of more solution oriented, we provide, okay, do this, do that. But that annoys a woman even more. So I think it's important just for a man, you know, not, again, I'm not an expert, so, you know, but uh, just to listen to, to his wife, inshallah, and that would, you know, solve a lot of problems. So I think that's what emotional intelligence is. It's a big topic, but that's just part of emotional intelligence. Sorry, not to kind of interrupt you normally, but the question is on emotional intimacy. So, I mean, intelligence is one thing, but. <laughs> okay, but well, yeah, emotional intimacy, uh, basically when a husband and wife share their personal problems with each other, that could be sexual problems, it could be financial, it could be personal, social, whatever it may be. You know, so kind of having that understanding, giving each other the space to speak. You know, uh, Stephen Covey, uh, who's a famous uh, self-help guru, I don't know if you've heard of it, he said, uh, somebody asked him, what's your success? He said, seek to understand first before being understood. So what he means by that is that, you know, listen to the other person and then, you know, what, ask them if they feel that they've been understood before you say your piece. Ask your wife, okay, do you feel I've heard you? Do you feel I've understood you? If she says yes, then say, is it okay for me? I would like to speak. And then she should also kind of have the same principle. So I think in a marriage, if, if a couple if couples do that, then, you know, we can solve a lot of conflict in shock. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Uh, another question that the sister asked was, what should a woman do if her husband continues, continually ignores her concerns or issues and so on? So uh, it's a very important uh, point for husband in particular that not, I think I did mention this as well, and not to ignore your wife. So in other words, if she does have any problems, then always try to, you know, as uh, Brother Inam said, to listen to her and uh, try to resolve these problems and issues. So obviously this is obviously advice to husbands that not to ignore your wife, but obviously the sister is asking what should she do if her husband continuously ignores her. So if it's something which is quite necessary or quite important, it could be certain rights which are not being fulfilled, then obviously if the husband is not listening to her, then it could be a good idea to get family involved. So like speak to, her, say for example, the husband's father, like there is the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, in talking about Abdullah bin Amr bin Asr bin Anhu, that when he got married, his wife <coughs> said to his father that Abdullah is always reading the mass, he's always like praying, he's always fasting, <coughs> he never ever spends any time with me. So that's an example of the wife speaking to Abdullah bin Amr bin Asr bin Anhu's father about the situation at home. Yeah? So as I said that if the wife is not listening to, sorry, if the husband is not listening to the wife or not dealing with the issues or the problems, then it'd probably be a good idea for the wife to then speak to another member of the husband's family who the person listens to. Another question, a woman has discovered her husband committing adultery uh, communication with another woman she wishes to reconcile but has severe issues with trust mostly due, her, due to her husband not wanting to provide her explanation for his actions continually leaves the house to return to his mother when confronted 
how should a woman tackle this? Okay, uh, it depends on what the sister wants to do here. This one, it depends on the sister. Obviously, if she wants to give it another go, yeah, if she wants to give another go, then it's fine, she can. Obviously, from the problem which we have in the question here, it seems as though that there's some trust issues here, or more in particular, he's not wanting to give an explanation of why he did that. So when a husband or someone is like that, that he's not giving the explanation why, you know, he committed that crime or what he, why he did that for, obviously that's a kind of a telltale sign that probably the husband is not that interested, he doesn't want to make it another go of it. So if that is the vibe that you're getting from that particular person that look, you know, he cheated on you, also on top of that he's not willing to give you an explanation why he did it, what was the cause, was it because of some frustration at home? He's not willing to open up and, more importantly, be honest with you. So if that is the case, then it's probably best that a woman probably thinks about, you know, uh, you know moving on and obviously ask the husband for a cancellation or a divorce of the marriage. Also, number eight, what should a woman do when a husband hides financial habits, loans, debts, solution, and so on? Uh, again, obviously in that situation, uh, you could get families involved, uh, you know, people who the husband kind of like listens to. Obviously, you know, these kind of things are more kind of individual one-to-one, -one, so it's important that, say, locally moms or someone, they could speak to the husband. Because obviously, as you know, husbands are not, they should try to be as uh, honest with their wives regarding everything, whether it's about their dealings, whether about meeting other people and so on, they should try to be honest because when you have an honest and an open relationship with your wife, then the marriage kind of lasts. Again, if he's hiding these kind of things, you should try to uh, speak to someone who he listens to, to uh, get advice and help regarding that. Another question here, can conditions be placed in marriage if there is a fear of the marriage being dissolved? How should these be formulated Islamically? So I, I did explain this before that you can place conditions, but if the husband or someone doesn't fulfill the conditions or the wife doesn't, then Islamically the marriage doesn't break. Yeah? Like, I'm trying to say it doesn't break, but the husband or wife will get sin for breaking a promise. So you can actually place conditions in marriage like you can say to the husband, that okay, I'm marrying you, but you can't divorce me. You can place these conditions. But, yeah, but if he does divorce her, the divorce will occur, and the promise the husband made, I'm not going to divorce you, that would be considered as him breaking a promise where he will get sin for that. Another question can istikhara be completed if a woman wishes to gain guidance in regards to staying in her marriage? due to conflict, disputes, so the answer is yes, uh, she can. It's not all the time istihara is required for getting married. You can also make istihara for staying in a marriage, whether you want to go ahead, stay in the marriage or not. You can also make istihara for that as well. Uh, another question, what if the common ground is slowly diminishing in a marriage? Should a woman live in hope or how to rekindle it? Um, I think it would be best in that situation to rekindle it. You know, you know put an effort in. Common ground, probably like uh, certain things which they probably agreed on and it seems as though that they're not keeping their word or their promise. So if the wife sees that this is slowly diminishing, she should try her best to rekindle, rekindle the marriage. Same goes for the husband as well. Uh, he sees that the marriage is slowly, slowly like you know, that same level of intensity or love, affection which was there at the beginning, not there anymore. Obviously, they should try to re rekindle, try to like you know do something. I said some rituals, you know, think about going for umrah, holiday, whatever. Do something to kind of rekindle the marriage. So it's better to try to make an effort in rekindling it. Another question: What if a woman has always been the breadwinner? and the one in authority and lived in the hope of 
roads reversing, continually struggled and wants to wants the man to be the leader Islamically, financially, the sole provider. How should a woman support or encourage this? Okay, so I think again the similar example like she probably was this the sole breadwinner or the breadwinner at the beginning of the marriage, probably got her husband over from Pakistan, India, you know, they bought the house, uh, she provided everything, but uh, she obviously wants the role to be reversed. What I mean by that is that she wants to that, take the, the secondary part of the marriage and wants her husband to be the, the primary person in the marriage. She's asking that how should she do this? So obviously the answer to that will be encouragement, uh, encouraging the husband, giving the husband, uh, giving the husband a role of responsibility. Tell the truth, uh, it depends on the person, by the way, because remember you can't change people. You know there are some people who are not fit to be the breadwinner. You know there are some people, men we're talking about, they don't have authority. They've always been the second fiddle and they like that that's the most they can do so just say if, if it is like that that say for example your husband is and has always been a second fiddle person never been the one to take the steering wheel never been the one to like you know you know take the marriage forward it's always been you and then he just followed you and he's like that naturally he's like that he's just like soft and he's always been second fiddle if that is the case then it's probably best that you just like keep on going your way in time. Because obviously it's going to be difficult. How are you going to change someone who's always been second fiddle? So because if it's fit right, it's like that. You can't change it. If you think that he can change and he can actually, you know, be the, the authoritative person and be the breadwinner, can work and so on, then in that situation, I think, what should the wife do who probably was the authoritative person early on in the marriage? It's just like, Tell your husband, give him responsibility, tell him that, look, this is your responsibility, you need to do this. And slowly, slowly, in that way, you know, give him uh, encouragement as well at the same time. And one day he may uh, become a dictator. <laughs> Lastly, what should a woman do if her husband does not wish to go forward with conflicts created by him as she requests for him to ask for forgiveness? So, uh, I wish to go forward with conflict. So, uh, I mean, probably what I just explained before, like, you know, for, for issues to be resolved, we need uh, two people, by the way, for it to be resolved. We need the husband and we need the wife. Now, seriously, if the husband's not probably willing to listen to you or not willing to resolve the disputes, as I mentioned before, that if you get other members of the family involved, uh, get the local imams involved, people who he listens to, Get them involved if he's not uh, willing to uh, listen to you. So I think that will be probably the answer in that situation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she just uh, asked a question to please. Say if you are married and if you don't get married again simply without taking the first one, is it? Yeah, it's allowed. Yeah. It's allowed. Obviously, and you, you should uh, get permission from the uh, first wife for more cooperation. So it doesn't break your heart, but if you did get money without the uh, uh, without the permission of the first wife, then the marriage would be allowed. Yeah. So uh, yeah, before I finish, just thank all the brothers for uh, coming, and also like to thank the volunteer brothers, uh, brothers at the back, inshallah, for the Saki brother Inam here. So the, uh, the easiest part is delivering the talk and the course. The the difficult part is the logistics, you know the the food and the, you know, the paperwork and so on. So I'd like to thank the brothers for, you know, giving their time for this noble cause. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their efforts and grant them Jannah. Brothers and sisters, just before we go, a few announcements. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Mufti Tawseed Mia for taking his time out from a very busy schedule and enlightening us with his knowledge and wisdom from the Allah you all Hopefully all of us have benefited, inshallah. I'd like to ask Brother Salim to uh, come forward and uh, present a gift that will start, inshallah. It's the least we can do, inshallah. I hope you enjoy the gift.
I'd like to thank everybody for uh, attending today. Uh, we hope it's been beneficial and fruitful to you, inshallah. If there's any further questions you have or questions that you feel haven't been answered, then we have a special feature on our mosque website. The mosque website is www.almaqislamicsector.com. We also have a Facebook page uh, and a Twitter page as well. So do follow us on the mosque website. There's a special feature entitled uh, ask the Mufti Q&A section, so ask the Imam, sorry, so uh, you can post your question directly on there and the Imam Muf Mulan Abdul Majid, Mufti Abdul Majid Nadeem will endeavour to answer your questions uh, as soon as possible, inshallah. Uh, um, and I'd like to conclude with the dua, Subhanahu wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.